Content warning. This series will discuss topics that may bring up painful experiences for you. Please take the time to surround yourself with good medicines. If need be, pause the playback and go for a walk, stretch, have a glass of water, and come back to the show when you feel comfortable. Welcome to the Métis Speaker Series. I'm your host, Darian Kovacs. On this podcast series, we will be exploring learning, healing, and rebuilding within the Métis community. Our goal is to create awareness of and generate discussion about Métis issues, as well as how to heal from and move forward in a healthy way. We hope to reduce Métis invisibility in BC through the personal stories from our Métis community members. This show is brought to you by Métis Nation BC and Jelly Marketing. Lawrence, real pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, why don't we start off, for those who have yet to meet you, tell us a bit about yourself um, and the role that you play now in the uh, Métis community. Yeah, so, I mean, I think being born in the Métis community, I definitely had a role, you know, from a baby yeah. uh, on to where I am today. But, you know, I grew up in Prince George, um, very, uh, I would say, a very affluent Métis neighborhood. Yeah. It was one of the times when we had Métis housing and, and about a three by five, um, three by three block by five block, yeah. you know, um, sort of neighborhood. And it was just all my cousins and, and everybody and uncles and aunties and you name it. Mm. And uh, really, we miss all that. You know, I miss growing up there. But I, I was there for, you know, when I was a baby till I was about 15 years old. So. Yeah. And then, you know, progressed to where I am now. And my role is at the Métis Nation of Alberta. Um, I currently sit as the treasurer, so I'm on the executive for the Métis Nation of Alberta, um, so with Audrey Petra and, and a few others, and then I also am the Region 3 president, so basically Southern Alberta, I uh, have about 18,000 members that I represent down here, so very large Métis community, and um, didn't ever actually ever think that I would actually be in this spot, but, you know, I am, and I'm here, and I think it's great. And, you know, one thing that I am able to do is uh, transfer that knowledge in, you know, growing up as Métis, especially for the ones who are sort of um, starting to identify and going through their processes. And I'm always good for a conversation or a coffee. Like. That, that is amazing. So not to compare, but to compare, um, size-wise, like membership-wise, where would there be kind of the, the largest groups of Métis people across Canada, for those that are interested, if they want to go to maybe a large population center? Well, Alberta is you know very vital uh, in that population grid because of all the work that's been happening in this province for quite a while. And our people are you know just staying one location; they'll go where the jobs are. Yeah. So our Alberta population is quite high, which is good. Uh, Saskatchewan and you know of course uh, Manitoba and through the homeland, right? And and we know BC has a very large population. Um, mm -hmm. More people are starting to identify there, which is great. Uh, you know, it's a certainly a granular thing. You know, they go where the work is. So that's predominantly if the work fades in Alberta, then they'll go somewhere else. Uh, and for you, the, the role that you play, what's some of your favorite parts about it? What's like the, the, the joy that you get out of your job? I think meeting people. Um, you know, we're a very event group, you know, maintain nation. That's who we are. We like to sit and we like to chat with each other in person. And COVID's had some really negative impacts to our community because all of our elders weren't allowed to meet anymore in, in our community and we weren't allowed to have dances. We weren't allowed to you know, really support those, those people who make the meals for us. And ju it just goes on the list, right? So, you know, starting a podcast like Squeaky Wheel for us was always just about creating that awareness and getting to those homes when we couldn't meet in person and letting them know what the Métis Nation is doing. It's yeah. amazing. And those that have yet to discover the Squeaky Wheel podcast, tell us about that and, and why you launched it and, and what they can expect from that show. Well, I think it, what it was when I first started it was I, I noticed that our community was uh, suffering through this health crisis that we're in now. And we just left, you know, and, and we're trying to get out of it. And we just wanted to create awareness around COVID, you know, relief funds and, and health and, and making sure we're washing our hands and 
doing little things like that. And then it developed into, well, let's do some little Métis cultural things. And I'll throw in, throw that in there. And then pretty soon COVID just went down the balance and Métis culture went up to Métis topics and, and all those other things. And, and having those Métis viewpoints. And I think that's what's important for us. And it, it was never in our intention to really form a podcast that really spread out Métis culture. It was all about COVID at the very beginning. So, wow. yeah, but now we're up to, I think, about 80 episodes. And wow. Moving forward on a lot of, you know, projects here and there. And it's, uh, we're getting support from the community, even our Friendship Center community now, and oil and gas, and they're looking at it to support it. And so it's good. Um, I, you know, Métis people have always been considered the hidden people. Uh, we're never out there. And, and now we have something that people can attach their eyes to. That's incredible. Um, maybe uh, some highlights, some episodes. I know, I know it's like saying, who's your favorite child? And I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot of what was your favorite episode. I'm just saying, what are some highlights uh, of episodes that you would recommend that someone wants to check out and, and, and listen to? And maybe some things that were maybe personal to you that you said, man, I did this interview or I did this episode and this is what it meant to me. I think for us, it's always our connection with Audrey Petra and, and her, her knowledge about the nation and where it's headed and self-government and those kind of things. I think that's very, really, very really important for us as a nation because we're progressing very, very quickly. Um, and sometimes when you turn the wheels too fast, you can sometimes lose control and you got to grab the steering wheel and move it around a bit and get back on, on that track again. And, and um, certainly that's one way to put it because I think it's an adjustment for everybody. And she just has this calming nature to her where she just kind of assures you that, you know, we're headed in the right direction as a nation. This is what Lou Riel wanted in the very beginning. And now we're going there. And I think that's important to highlight. Um, <clears throat> and my connection, you know, certainly to our musicians, because I come from a very predominant little family. So, you know, we have young guys like Alex Kosterup who comes in and plays for us. And, and that's always good. And the odd musician will, you know, attend. We had Lori Cole. We, from Nashville, a very incredible singer, you know, and those types of things we want to really highlight. That is really cool. And maybe those that maybe, you know, are discovering the Métis uh, community and, and, and the Métis people, like you said, they've you know, been a hidden people for so long. Uh, and you've done what, you know, 80 episodes and, and probably going to have a bunch more by the time this is released. Uh, what's something really, you know, that you've noticed about Métis people in your interviews? Maybe something like a, a common thread or something that really is like, man, if people knew this about the Métis people, they should know that. And that's what you've discovered over the time of interviewing. Well, I think for us, you know, what we kind of discover as Métis people is that, you know, who really um, was part of this Western land, you know, before Confederation kind of encroached in and and, you know, the Métis people here for you know, quite a number of generations in the Western Plains. And, and um, we were aligned with the First Nation families through marriages. We were married in and we were, got those protocols and those permissions to be on this place. And then when Canada came in, they didn't do those protocols properly. And they didn't do those things that were necessary. And that's when First Nations and Métis started to stand up. And, but when you look at the collective norm of people's knowledge about Métis people, they only refer to the First Nations because that's what they're taught in school. And that whole Métis narrative is left out completely. And that's a disservice to us as a nation, disservice to us as Indigenous people. So we need to be able to create these venues and start telling it. You know, we should be on CBC quite all, like all the time and we should be on AP Plan all the time we should be on all these we should have tv shows we should have movies about us there's so many stories that are layered in the metis community that nobody is telling them right now and it's a, a pretty sad state of affairs and i think what has to happen is our storytellers have to start coming and we always remember muriel's quote about his people will sleep for 100 years and will be the artists that awaken right and that's what's going to happen our artists need to start coming forward, start writing books, start writing our history the way it should be told and not, you know, layered in those academic institutions anymore, right? Because it really does it us a disservice. Wow. Uh, and as far as uh, Métis artists that you love, what are some, maybe some like visual artists or musicians that you'd recommend that people should check out? Um, you know, it, it's, 
I, you know, I love all the fiddle players. So Daniel Gervais, uh, Alice Custer, you know, like all of those young guys that are coming forward. Or Calvin Ballrath from the other generation, <clears throat> you know, um, certainly uh, Warren Arkin, John Arkin, and, and all these individuals that certainly had played the fiddle for us for many years. And that's, that's one good step. And knowing that our people who are Métis who sing contemporary style music, that should be supported also. And how do we open those, those doorways and those pathways for them? That's awesome. Um, for you, uh, hope, right? It, it, I know there's a lot of um, maybe discouragement in the news and, and, and sad stories in the news. What gives you hope these days for the, the role you play in, in being Métis? Well, I think it's for us to see, you know, we need those strong leaders to come forward. You know, I, I sometimes get tired of the sort of conversation and dialogue that we need to sit at the table and understand each other. Well, no, we need to actually tell government, we need to sort of speak to us if you're going to uh, adhere to any of the policies that you're creating. And we need to have really those strong voices forward to actually say to them, whether you're a city or you're a province or you're the Canadian government, us to really pave the way for us to be recognized. And that's the most important thing us, for me as a leader. And I'll hold people accountable. Um, and that's you know part of it too. And I think that was probably the way I was raised. My ancestors were, you know, in the Battle of Grand Couteau, they were at the Battle of Seven Oaks, they were at Batoche. I have an ancestor that's buried there. You know, it's so sometimes in our DNA to, to be those squeaky wheels and we need to be that. And squeaky wheel is a reference to our carts that, you know, we didn't use uh, your traditional metal. We didn't use, you know, even things to stop the squeaking. And when we rolled through the prairies, the neighbors would complain to us complain about us all the time being too loud and being too, too squeaky but we need to we sort of regain that control of the squeaky wheel and become the squeaky wheel that's amazing do, do you find that you when you meet metis people do you find that they are a little more like they have the trait of being a squeaky wheel when it comes to anything in life oh yeah you notice it and then you sometimes notice it even from the younger ages you know the real vocal ones right yeah i really take a stand and that's important. You know, those voices shouldn't be minimized. You know? And uh, I think that's you know, the best thing I can say to any of our young people out there that want to get into leading the way, whether you're yeah. leading the way from school or, or at home, just lead it positively, not negatively, but just be really certain that you're not allowed to be pushed over. Yeah. Wow. And, and so you have a counterpart. So you're Southern Alberta. You have a counterpart in Northern Alberta, correct? Well, there's actually six regions. So, okay, um, six two. regions. Okay. Yeah. So it goes on like a backwards U. So one is like Fort McMurray, and then yeah. two is Lloydminster, and then it goes down and then up, okay. right? Four is sort of the Edmonton area. Four has yeah. the largest population. Okay. So we have the second highest population with the largest geographic area. We, okay. we cover quite a distance down here in Southern Alberta. That's really cool. And those that maybe don't know, is there a, a, a Alberta head as well for all of Alberta? Or is it, do you work? Yes, that's all? right. Okay. So our, our provincial president is Audrey Pacha. Our provincial vice is Dan Cardinal. Yeah. And um, yeah, they're, I mean, Audrey, I think, has been uh, with the MA since the 80s. You know, yeah. For a long, a long time. That's really cool. That's really cool. <laughs> uh, what do you, um, you know, when it comes to like, you know, gathering with other leaders and other Métis leaders, what do you see where it's, there's collaboration? And maybe, maybe it's not even Métis leaders, but maybe some First Nations leaders or Inuit leaders. Have you seen any collaboration happening or, or collaborations that you're hoping for that would cause some good change? Well, I mean, I've always been a supporter of, because uh, I, I worked in Vancouver in the downtown yeah. side, and there was an organization there called the Vancouver Aboriginal Council. And and I, I'm pretty sure they developed into a different name now, but they, yeah. they had representation of all the agencies and they work to, to really uh, bring them all together. And I think that's what we need. We need is a center yeah. association or an organization that can actually bring yeah. us all to one table. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's really I mean, cool. Yeah, and it's vital for our communities because you know sometimes government has the ability to silo us quite effectively. Yeah. Or sometimes, you know, but when they start to see us gather and yeah. move together, yeah. they'll try to do it as much as they can, right? Because they yeah. like to see us fighting. Yeah. Yeah. Is, and tell me about that. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think there's that, the, the, the kind of 
decide, you know, a divisiveness, right? Or a dividing and, and that thing and, and how do we fight against it? And you don't need to get into the details of who and what and when and where, but like, maybe why do you think that's around the Métis culture? And then, but how do we fight that and counteract it and, and be collaborative? Well, I think for us, you know, it's, it's not about us getting, forcing the issue, but I think yeah. what has to happen is our, our families need to meet together again and start talking about our history yeah. and our stories and our relations. And that's when the sort of bond starts to happen. Okay. And then we can create treaties with one another. You yeah. know, and that's the most important mm -hmm. thing. Now, government will always try to interfere with that because they don't want to actually see us get to that place where we're all working together. Yeah. It's counterproductive to what they're, they're trying to do. Yeah. And that's, uh, sorry, but that, you know, that's uh, a very harsh reality, but that's something I've noticed in the last 20 years working in Aboriginal organization. That's you know, predominantly what happens. And once we, as a, you know, Aboriginal community, start to get together and start you know, meeting, you know, even our First Nations families too, because you know, we do cross share quite a bit with that too. And you know, I have First Nation first cousins. You know, and, and um, what does that actually mean to me as an Métis person? Are we so divided? And we have a lot of commonalities. You know, I can go to, you know, sit, sit at a powwow with a chief, or sit at you know, or go to one of their events and, you know, we have a commonality with the minutes, right? And I don't think that should be just be divided and say, you're on that fence, I'm on this fence. Yeah. In fact, I think we should actually work together. That's awesome. That's, that's really cool. And tell me about this, you know, the positive side of the government. I know we've, there's been a lot of frustration with some of the government stuff, but tell me some positive stories of being like, man, this initiative happened or this Thing got funded or maybe some initiatives that you're saying man the government's doing it right in these spots and whether that's provincially or federally i'd love to hear some you know, stories of encouragement yeah. well i think for us you know, I, you know when i say speak for us because i speak for 18 vast people but yeah. you know one thing i noticed when i got into office in 2014 well yeah. that was two years before daniels so yeah. i've seen the difference between daniels the impacts there of april 2016 to where we are now hmm. right and going through the process where we were fighting very hard for recognition um, to the Daniels to now having significant agreements with Canada, with the Métis Nation Accord, and, and now we're moving into self-government. And that's uh, incredible steps just in a short little while. Yeah. Could you, for those, and I don't know it, I haven't read it maybe, the, the Accord, could you describe it like in a summary, like explain it to me like I'm five years old. How would you describe the Accord and what happened? Well, the accord is kind of a, a promise for us to work together, like a, a significant, not an MOU, because an MOU is just a handshake. Yeah. But this one is more, it gives administration from Canada. Yeah. It gives direction to administration to begin their work with us. Yeah. And in those steps, they talked about, you know, self-government. And then they also talked the script, you know, you know, what happened there and the script system and how that was detrimental to us and, some lawyers are calling it the largest land swindle in, in North America or possibly the world, right? Wow. The way that Canada did that, right? And took yeah. a lot of those homesteads away from the Métis. And that sort of, these conversations are sort of developing to policies now and, and, and self-government framework that we signed with them in, in 20, uh, God, it would be 2019, I think now. And now we're moving into talks with our own government to look at our own constitution and then we're going to be moving away from being nonprofit societies now, right? there's going to be a transition where we step away from that and certainly canada will have funds available from their their yearly budget and geared for the metis wow that's that's pretty exciting and yes. the, and and for you at the position you're in what, how are you watching are you kind of watching and kind of actively involved or are you watching and kind of watching the the players do their role and what's kind of the role you're playing these days well i think i'm at pretty actively involved yeah, yeah. i mean i'm one of the 40 uh, members of the Métis national council and the delegates and cool. certainly um, president Caron is you know and she's stepped into some pretty hard uh, places right now and you know, I think for us, we need to support her. She is the president, the national president. And, um, but, you know, carrying on and carrying forward, you know, I have a luxury of having a, a meeting with her in the next week or so and, and talking about how she can support Southern Alberta, how can we support her, you know, and, and move the nation forward. And I think that's important for all of us delegates, the 40 of us, to really 
show some support and leadership and, and uh, where we're headed as a nation. Yeah. It's incredible even just getting the emails uh, from, you know, head office, just talking about even funding for training, the amount of support, yeah. whether it's even getting a laptop or, you know, support so you could get a new job or advance in your career. Like that's incredible. And, and, and I think that's some of the, the work that's been done over the years that, you know, we, you know, those that are um, maybe newer to the Métis community or, um, you know, not kind of involved in the leadership structure are benefiting from and, and you know, discovering new and, and really benefiting hugely. Yeah, I mean, we have education, training, research funded. We have Akita Wasan, which is our business arm. I know you guys have your economic development portion there, um, as well as all the scholarships that are available for individuals. And we know that's going to rise and hopefully have it at every institution, every university for our yeah. people. Right? And I think that's important that they can access it, have a yeah. place to go and, and get educated. And we want first, second, third, fourth year all funded. I mean, yeah. that's the goal, right? Yeah. Just right across the realm. That's incredible. That's incredible. So um, next season of Squeaky Wheel, what can we expect? Who are some guests maybe that, that are coming on or what, what are some shows that you're excited about? Well, one for us is, is a gathering a studio space, but that wasn't really too hard to find. Getting in person. Yeah. Um, but definitely we want to bring more music in. Yeah. have more of a, a black box studio style yeah. so we can hand over to a guest and yeah. they can show their talents or sit in sit behind the table and talk about you know their viewpoints on, on the or, or just on contemporary stuff like we talk yeah. about ukraine we talk about all these other topics um but definitely through our eyes and you know what we think you know even the convoy what we feel is you know what about western canada because that's what they're trying to do they're trying to create awareness for themselves whether they're they doing it the right in the right way yeah you know our real like they could really learn from our history you know when we stood up to the government for encroaching in the west you know um but you know i think that those steps need to, to happen eventually you know but there's a lot of dissatisfied people you know west of ontario and we know that and, and uh, certainly they have a voice for sure yeah. and you know, the, the mates you have one too. And yeah. we've, we've been saying this for 156 years now. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. Uh, so I got a question for you. You, uh, if you had the chance, like uh, you had some special magical megaphone, uh, microphone that got into the ears of every Canadian uh, that wasn't Métis. And you had a minute to say something to them about Métis. So you, you could educate them. You could encourage them. If you had a minute to say one thing to those that were not Métis about the Métis people, what, what do you think is the most important thing you'd love for those outside of the Métis community to know and be aware of? Yeah. I think for us, it, it's always about creating that awareness. And if you want to learn who the Métis are, or because we know First Nations, Métis, and anyway, is you know mentioned in section 35 there's no hierarchy but people seem to focus on first nations which is all in good but sometimes they're forgetting about the other two and that if i had a minute to say something i would kind of say to them kindly and, and say it like say it, say it like you're speaking yes let's, let's say it like you're actually talking right at and you and you're you're talking right your microphone has has transformed into a magical microphone what's the message i would say canada and all, all of us Canadians, um, I want you guys to really take the time and effort that when referring to Indigenous folks, that we refer to all three groups and do some research and have fun reading those books and have fun looking at those movies. Turn in, tune into AP Film and those stations and understand who the Métis are. You know, we're, we're not so complex as you think. Um, we're complex within each other, but definitely not to Canadians. It's a very simple thing to do. That's awesome, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now uh, a different microphone, you know, also magical, but this one is speaking to all the Métis people of Canada. Uh, what is maybe like a, an encouragement or um, something that you'd like to say, if you could say something to every Métis person in Canada, what would you want to encourage them with or, or say to them? Hang in there. You know, we, we're going to get to that place where we're going to have significant recognition and Canada has a fiduciary responsibility to make you folks. And what that means, and open that door to be um, not so hidden, but find yourself, find your family, talk about being Métis, all those things that 
our parents were never able to speak about. Let's talk about it. That's awesome. Lawrence, did you ever watch the video? It was on Facebook and it was a, a little girl explaining about the Métis uh, people. Did you ever see it and yes. explain the different generations? Yeah, I noticed that. I, we shared that too on our social media, but yeah, she was a pretty gem. But she got it pretty spot on, you know, right yeah. through, you know, talking about the hidden and now we're in that found generation, which we are. And I'm starting to see it, you know. I grew up in Prince George, knew I was an AT, got chased home because I was an AT, you know, but, you know, we didn't raise flags or wear sashes. We just knew we were an AT because of the music, the food, the culture, those types of things. And I'm really fortunate to grow up in that sort of society and, and it really helped significant a place for me. Um, and I think what's is, it's kind of a relearning sometimes because, you know, we've been getting into medicine talks and herbal medicine. And, you know, we had a grandma who used to speak Cree to us. She, and she was in residential school and, you know, she taught us about medicine, but you never really think about that until much later in life. And, you know, you, you're starting to learn about the, all these other things. And we were really unfortunate to get, we were fortunate to get those teachings, but we didn't realize we were getting teachings at that time, right? And I think that was one sort of things that if she was here today, I'd give her a hug, right? Mm -hmm. Because that was, that was so valuable for us growing up. And I'd, I'd rather not lose that. So. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. It's beautiful. Um, Métis meal, tell me what a, a Métis food meal looks like. Well, Growing your up. traditional baked bannock uh, with some hamburger soup or bullets. Um, people think it's ragu or something, but it definitely has a feel to this is a meaty dinner, you know, either moose meat or deer meat or you know, yeah. meatballs and kind of all that good stuff. Or, you know, hamburger soup is always vital for us to yeah. get, but, you know, I, I really miss that. That's awesome. Lawrence, uh, any closing thoughts? feelings, remarks that you'd like to share with, uh, with listeners today? Um, not really. I mean, just enjoy life. You know, we're, summer's coming and spring yeah. is going to be here. For us, that's kind of our new year. That's when yeah. you know, the plants start to rise from the earth and are, we can get outside and enjoy the sun. And, and that's what I kind of say to our community. It's just, we've had a hard two and a half years or three years now. Let's... Yeah. Um, let's get over that hump and start sitting with our families in a safe manner, but also be cognizant that uh, this is for our well-being. You know, and we're going to move forward. That's awesome. Lawrence, thank you for being here today. Really appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So next time you are in uh, British Columbia or vice versa, I'm in Southern Alberta, Airdrie area. Uh, we'll have to do a uh, show in person, uh, like a collaborative show, and then we could syndicate it on both of our respective uh, podcast here yeah you sure i mean maybe come for stampede you know stampede's always a, a good time up here yes um and then maybe i'll come to gee i ran in the vancouver marathon oh one time. nice yeah but uh, <laughs> no uh definitely want to come back to vancouver or or even british columbia and Okanagan. i have a brother there who, who was a staff sergeant who's retiring this year uh, in all of her and, yeah. and uh has a boat the whole nine yards but definitely want to go visit him and I have another brother in Fort St. John and out in the bush working up there. That's what he likes to do since he was a kid and, and uh, ventures out. Uh, I think that's a Métis thing. I'm not sure. I can't last more than an hour with my cell phone out in the bush, but mm -hmm. definitely something he's used to. That's awesome. Well, Lawrence, thank you again. Really appreciate the stories and what you're up to and, and make sure that uh, we'll put a link to the Squeaky Wheel podcast in the show notes and uh, for people to check that out. Yes. Appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us this week, and we'll see you next time on the show. Okay. Thank you. This has been the Metis Speaker Series podcast. I'm Darian Kovacs. Thanks to Metis Nation BC for making this possible, with funding provided by the Civil Forfeiture Office's Indigenous Healing Stream. You can listen to all of our episodes learn more about the podcast, and sign up to the Métis Nation of BC newsletter to stay up to date on Métis news at metispodcastseries.ca. You can find out more about the music we're playing by Love Life by visiting 
SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash lovelifeofficial, L-U-V-L-Y-F official, and link in the show notes for your convenience. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast listening device. See you again soon. Mina Kawapa Mitten. Thank you, Marcy, for listening. Thank you.